Joy. Joy. The first thing, the first thing that must be said about joy is that it is a work. Before we think of joy as a sentiment or a feeling or even a delusion, let's first name it for what it truly is. It is a work of resistance against despair and death. The marvelous, the marvelous joy workers who taught me this were the people who raised me. I was raised by people of the dirt, of the earth, who lived on land that they did not own and who raised crops for people who would never pay them an honest wage for their back-breaking labor. My people were sharecroppers in the South who turned their dreams toward the North and toward what Isabel Wilkerson called in her marvelous book, The Warmth of Other Sons. The black folks who raised me lived in the constant showers of racial oppression and disappointment, moving from the Jim Crow South to the racist North, from racist straw bosses to racist factory foremen, from Southern struggles to Northern struggles, from old forms of being underpaid and overworked to new forms of the same situation. And in the midst of all that, my parents and my people worked hard, worked hard at joy. What does it mean to work at joy? This is the question for us this morning as we sit in a difficult moment in history when joy seems to be in such short supply. I want to draw on and extend the wisdom of my folks to help us think about the work of joy. The magnificent joy workers who invited me into their craft were church folks. Joy work for them is a work from the inside, inside the sweat, inside the silencing, inside the secret, inside a segregation that will not yield. How do oppressed peoples access joy? From within a segregation they did not design and from within fragmentation and division that they did not want. Segregated joy work follows what James C. Scott calls the arts of resistance for oppressed peoples and functions within the hidden transcripts of speech that are off stage or behind the scenes in the sequestered spaces of the dominated. There in those segregated spaces, joy work commences working in the absurdities, the absurdities of lack surrounded by places of plenty. When you live in places of limited resources, limited social and environmental supports, and limited opportunities, you do have a wealth of despair. It is a currency that people struggle not to use. Despair has always been a currency born of death. We theological types, we know this. It is death's fundamental calling card. The black church folks I knew understood that joy work begins with renouncing despair renouncing despair by angling one's body against it. Joy work is always body work, always body work, and it is serious and dangerous work because you are negotiating reality at the site of despair and death. A body angling itself against despair 
is one engaged in the art of dancing ever so slightly above the line of sheer survival, moving, twisting, turning between surviving and thriving. Not everyone, not everyone takes on this art. It is not a uniform characteristic of all black diaspora people or of any people. It is fundamentally a decision of thought, act, gesture, posture, dress, mood, or manner to do something different with the given instead of simply giving into the given the given of suffering, the given of pain, of oppression, of fear, and especially, especially of violence. Joy being formed under these constrained conditions is always a profound work of improvisation. And improvisation, as we all know in this room, is never just making things up. Improvisation is working with the given, the broken, the fragment, and drawing on moves and gestures, moves and gestures of those who have gone before you and those who surround you engaged in their own acts of improvisation. <clears throat> I want to return to this theme of improvisation a little later, but what is crucial to capture here is that joy being formed under this pressure is always an oppositional joy that stands against the world and against the prevailing racial and social order. This oppositional joy humanizes dehumanizing conditions. This is the art, my friends, this is the art of making pain productive without ever trying to justify or glorify suffering. For so many church folk, the quintessential site of productive pain and the place where their joy is rooted is the body of Jesus and his own joy work. There is this passage of scripture in the New Testament that so many people seized upon that suggested an extraordinary connection between Jesus' joy and their own joy. Found in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it states, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. My folks and so many other people of color saw in Jesus a joy that sustained him through his criminalization, his isolating shaming, his torture, and of course, his capital punishment. Jesus' joy was a joy found in contradiction, not in the resolution of contradiction. It was a joy sustained, that sustained him in conflict, never eradicating the conflicts he faced. Jesus' joy inside constrained conditions not only matched the constrained conditions of black life, but it also captured, captured those conditions, brought them into the divine life, and made Jesus an insider in the work of joy, and made joy work for so many Christians of the black diaspora, a work inside Jesus himself, a work inside his body. Their joy was born of their deep faith in and their love for Jesus, their every step in the footsteps of Jesus, each day that asking that his joy <clears throat> would be their joy. Yet yeah, this, is, this is difficult work 
as so many people, especially those of the black diaspora, understand all too well. Because joy work, my friends, always lives close to addiction. Addiction is the anti-side, the shadow side of joy work, haunting it with another option in the face of the given. That option is to give into the given and turn despair into a teacher. And by whatever means at one's disposal, by whatever one can get their hands on, to lose oneself in it, even if only for fleeting moments. Addiction has been with us from the beginning, from the beginning of it all. And it has been, it has been on the hunt, it has been on the hunt for people of color around the world from the first moment modern colonial settlers gave indigenous peoples alcohol and weapons and took their land. That was the beginning of the hunt. But addiction's greed has never known boundaries. And now, as we all know, it hunts for all of us. Joy work <clears throat> and the anti-joy work of addiction, they look, at, they look like each other, each a form of improvisation, each capturing whatever fragments of life they have at hand, a gesture, a stolen moment, a few words here and there, a laugh, a shared story, shared pain, shared anguish, frustration, a stubborn memory, a kiss, a hug, a touch. Each weaves these fragments together, but one aims to bind people to life, and the other aims toward death. Improvisation, improvisation always aims either at life or death, either forming a new that would destroy or a new that would heal. Even faith, any religious faith, can be captured in addiction once it aligns itself with death. Faith that becomes addiction loses joy in the desire to control bodies and in the power of violence. Addiction and real joy both work both, excuse me, addiction and real joy work both aim to cover the body, to capture the body in ecstasy because we need ecstasy. We are creatures created by God for ecstasy with God. This is what the people who rooted their joy work in Jesus imagined it as a work inside Jesus himself. This is what they showed me. Joy work rooted in Jesus is always work of the creature, vulnerable, fragile, and unstable, and in need of community and communion. Aiming at ecstasy is never the problem. We are always aiming at ecstasy. It is the type of entanglements necessary to aim at it. That's the problem. Joy requires the right entanglements, which is to say, which is to say that it works, that it is work that cannot be sustained alone, nor is it work that can be done without space. Joy requires space. That's the second thing that needs to be said about joy. What constitutes, what constitutes a space of joy? And where are those spaces to be found? For so many diaspora peoples, the spaces of joy have been sequestered spaces, segregated spaces, where the pleasures of unguarded speech unguarded speech, 
is often coupled with aesthetic pleasure. This space could be what I call cultural nationalist space, which is space of a people, by a people, and for a particular people that conducts the performances and rituals of enjoyment. This fact is to be both celebrated and mourned. Just as much as geography matters in structuring pain and suffering, oppression and domination, and of course, death, geography matters in joy work. In specific places, a people can repeat their joy and know themselves, know themselves in the repetition. For many black folks, that place would be the church, but it could also be a good club. I say a good club, a good club, or a bar, I mean a good bar, a gym, a barber shop, a beauty shop, someone's home, and even a street corner. You need a place to teach people how to make joy, a place that can also teach them how to handle the contradictions of life. Yet the space of joy is also a psychic space of emotional and spiritual habitation. Psychic space and geographic place dance together in memory and dream, in fantasy and hope. One example of this is sonic space, a space constituted by music. Music and joy have a long and celebrated history together among black diaspora peoples. This sonic space often becomes a womb for joy where it could live and breathe, take flight through sound, weaving together bodies and places in join habitation, the joy of the body and the joy of the place becoming one. Learning how to access this space, learning how to access this space of joy is a spiritual discipline, a discipline shared by Christian and non-Christian alike. However, Afro-Christianity has historically been a grand facilitator of this spiritual discipline as displaced African peoples taught themselves and their children how and what it means to inhabit the sonic space of joy, the sonic space of joy. One powerful sight of joy within sonic space has been the blues. The blues have always existed in a Trinitarian fashion, as a mode of musicality, and as a particular musical structure or idiom, and of course, of course, as a way of life. You got that? Those three? The three or one? The blues at essence, the blues at essence is a method of working contradiction and dissonance into a statement of pained, pained life yet being lived well. Did you get that? The importance of the blues as a grand architectonic of modernism and modern music from gospel to country to hip hop has been well documented. But we are yet to fully appreciate the role of the blues in creating sonic space, a space that many people can inhabit at the same time. I have listened to and watched, watched people drawing on the blues create sonic spaces of joy, and then press their whole bodies, their whole bodies into those spaces of joy. Sonic space has always carried the possibilities of joining people together in joy work and rooting us together in real places. You can glimpse this possibility in a good concert or a good worship service or in a good dance where people find themselves grasping for a shared ecstasy, 
Joy work, joy work is communal work. It is the work of the people. And joy work should entangle us together. Yet our spaces of joy are for the most part constrained in racial and cultural segregation and shaped in social hierarchies. And the work of joy has been in too many cases taken from us and commodified and then presented to us as things to be bought and sold. Sonic spaces exist all around us in commodity form as aesthetic bubbles. We carry them in our pockets and through our earbuds. Now, I for one am glad that so many people carry their theme music and their visual meals in their pockets everywhere they go. I think that's a sign of civilization. But I long for a pedagogy of sonic space that teaches us how to inhabit it together and that invites us into a shared joy work, a shared joy work. So the question for us is this, as I prepare to close. I'm, I'm a Baptist minister, so you know what that means. I'm going for another 20 minutes. <laughs> you say I'm prepared to close just to keep people interested, but you keep on going. That's a, so, so, the question for, so the question for us is this, is there the possibility of a joy that joins? Joins people who would never imagine their joy work together, but usually are forced to imagine their joy work in isolation or either against one another for fear of exploitation. This, it seems to me, is a crucial question for Christianity, but for every other religion. If the joy of a religion sustains its adherence, even in the face of the brutalities of life and over against the addiction of violence in all its forms, has that joy work exhausted itself in that very work, in that very work of survival? I think not. Because if joy is a reality of the creature, then joy is always an opportunity to link us in ways only limited by our imagination. Too many Christians, however, continue to promote segregated joy work through the limited ways we imagine life together, bound as it is by racial reasoning and geographic segregation. What I've learned from my people a long time ago is that Jesus presents a joy that gathers. His joy gathers its strength from the cloud of witnesses of God's faithfulness. Yet even further, his joy draws life from the life of God. The joy of life with God that marked the life of his people also marks his life in extraordinary ways. It is a joy he once shared among his disciples. <clears throat> the words from John chapter 15, 8 through 13, point this, point this out to us. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear fruit and become my disciples. <clears throat> As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Completed joy suggested in this lovely passage is a joy that connects like an expanding circuit. The possibility of a joy that gathers is already implicit in African diaspora Christianity as it is in many other forms of religious faith. Segregated joy, however, was thrust upon the African Christian and took on its horrific dimensions 
through the centuries of inflicted terrorism, white supremacy, teaching these and other Christians that real joy cannot be found at the site of mixture, at the site of joining, at the site of shared life. Thankfully, there were those who pressed against segregated joy, opting for spaces of shared desire and hope that would yield the stolen pleasure of a joy that suggested a different way, a different life. Sonic Space was often host to such outbreaks of illicit joy, illegal joy, as people shared in music and dance, bodies turning, twisting, touching, turning themselves, even if only for a moment, into conduits of exchange that would unleash a power to create the cultural Baroque and open new avenues of thought and dream for a better life together. The potential of a joy that gathers from within Afro-diaspora peoples resides in its long history, and Afro-Christianity resides in its long history of a radical egalitarianism in the spirit that acknowledged the ability of God to take hold of any life, no matter how resistant. The historian Albert Rabato suggested that sometimes even slave and slave master shared a common conversion and a common ecstasy. The issue, however, has always been how might a shared ecstasy be sustained? How might a shared joy become constitutive of a shared thriving life, a life freed from oppression and violence. A joy that moves through boundaries and overcomes social fragmentation requires the desire to locate joy work in new spaces that become more than a search for new commodities to consume. A gathering joy is possible only if there are those who are willing to resist modes of life that, al that align joy with the structuring energies of class, gender, and racial division, a new kind of gathering joy is possible where we do marvelous things with joy, but it will require fugitive acts, acts that break open not only our despair, but the despair of others by breaking down the walls that exist even in our joy. Thank you very much. I think we have a, f a few minutes for uh, for a few a few questions. There should be I see one mic, or there's another two mic runners. Um, so if you have a question, raise your hand, and we can get a mic to you. And so please tell us your name and where you are before yes. you before you give us your question. That'd be good. And uh, please be brief. Do you want to want to field your own question? Are we glad to? <laughs> Thank you so much. That was just so powerful. David Holmes, uh, Pepperdine University. Um, I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more about uh, these spaces of joy, and you mentioned the church and some other places, and how, if at all, they differ from uh, some of the work that's been done for years on hush harbors. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, obviously, historically, spaces of joy for so many African diaspora people began in places like hush harbors. But as, um, I mean, um, I'm thinking of something Fred Moten once said to me that um, it would be possible even to imagine the emergence of joy work in the whole of a slave ship. People chained together, death all around them, beginning to try to do that work there to survive the absurdity of a space that is nothing but death bound to commodity form. 
So I think there, there's a, 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 um, a deep connection between all the spaces where oppressed peoples find that they have been sequestered into the places of the secret and the beginning of joy work. And as I said, it's to be celebrated but also mourned because it is, it is a space that should not be in the way it is as a space. Yeah. You can go, ahead, go ahead and get started with your question. There you go. Just behind you. Uh, Mark Demers, I'm United Methodist Clergy. Uh, your reference to addictions, might you speak to um, and the need for and, and joy as a spiritual discipline, the work of discipline? How do the 12 steps figure into that? That's an interesting question. I never thought about how 12 steps figure into um, that. Um, what I can say is that I understand both joy work and addiction to be both forms of improvisation. Both are people working with the given. One turn toward a creative work that is drawing toward death. And so I understand, and as I've seen it done, in trying to address addiction, one of the most important things is to try to realign the joy work, to draw people into a different form of improvisation, right? To find a different way to capture their energies and their creativity and turn it away from what would destroy them toward life. This is, this is why it's so important to help people capture the creativity at the heart of doing joy work. This is why it's so terrible that our joy work has been taken from us and commodified, making us passive recipients of joy. We have to resist that commodification and make joy work again the work of the people. How do we draw people back into their own joy work? And of course, as you know, joy work is always work that pushes, when it's done right, it always pushes against capitalism and commodity formation. Because it's not what you buy that does joy work. It's what you create that does joy work. I mean, growing up, growing up um, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, without, at the youngest of a, of a lot of kids, it was not much that I got that was not hand-me-down, but I had to work with that stuff. <laughs> and so many other peoples. There's a great, there's a great book edited by um, Susan Natal and um, um, Achille, what's his name? The South African theorist. It's called Ugly Beauty. And it's a book about how South African artists, many artists work with trash. What does it mean to have to always work with what others throw away? And that you work with the disposed at the site of disposal. And out of that, creating life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, doctor. So my question, uh, you've, you've spoken a lot about the bodiedness of joy talk about possibilities of joy in space and how those spaces could be potentially embodied, shared spaces, assuming all through bodiedness. Can you say something about whiteness uh, in relation to joy, but also the bodiedness? Because most spaces that are the sort of negative to the spaces you're describing particularly have a givenness of whiteness, or whiteness claims and proposes a kind mm. of givenness. Mm -hmm. What does it mean if there is this kind of default or a givenness which is disembodied? Mm. How then do we imagine even um, entering those spaces or proposing joining those spaces, uh, the idea that you're proposing for the particular and sequestered yeah. space being something that is grown or expanded or even shared? How, if whiteness is a givenness which is disembodied and pushing against bodiedness, yeah. and, uh, can that occur? How do you imagine that? What yeah, possibilities a, are there? That's a great question. Let me think about that for a moment. Well, part of the difficulty is um, helping people imagine a body apart from whiteness. 
And um, that's very difficult work for us because what's, what's at heart in commodity formation is the presentation of one particular image of joy. And this has to do with the way in which whiteness, uh, I'll try to do this simply if I, as I can. This is the way whiteness uh, invites us into a work of approximation. Let me, exp what I, let me explain what I mean by that. Advertisers know that um, they live in a diverse world. They know that. So the question has to be asked, if, if all advertisers who are very smart people know that they live in a diverse world, why across the planet are so many body models, so many images shaped around white bodies? Why is that the case? And they know they live in a diverse world. There's some diversity, but they know by and large they, that, it's, that they don't need to operate in that. What they all understand is what we understand. We live in a tacit agreement that white bodies may represent the many for us. That, and we can live into a process of approximation. So that when someone looks at a white model, they don't often imagine themselves becoming white. They imagine that they can approximate the joy of that model in that dress, in that sweater, in that car, in that house, by having the product. It's a work of approximation. So the challenge I think Kenyon is to fundamentally take back that joy work from advertisers, to try to challenge the visual with a different visual apparatus, an array, a different visual appetite that might begin to call into question the work, the shared work of approximation that we are all in. We allow those images to do that kind of fantasy creating joy-forming work for us. And so the challenge is to fundamentally call it out. What, what I used to do back in my, um, my youth leader, leadership days with, with uh, uh, kids in churches, that I would um, put a bunch of kids together and I would show them, we would look at the ads together. And being in that room together, looking at these ads and asking them, what is the ad wanting you to do? What is it ad wanting you to be? And then for the first time being able to show them this work of approximation with these white models. That's not a really good answer to your incredible question. I'll have to think about that. Maybe write a couple of chapters on that, but that's a great question. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is so quick. Okay. He won't have to think. All right. <laughs> <laughs> this, will, this will be our last question. <laughs> I'm Jeanette Harris, a lay pastor in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And my question is, does this joy work, or can this joy work, break down the barriers between denominations? The question was, can the joy work break down the denominations between barriers? I mean, um, barriers between, <laughs> barriers, between the, barriers between denominations, right, got it. Well, yeah, that's what it is. Um, Freudian slip wasn't that. <laughs> I would hope so, but um, I think part of the challenge is to see this as work that must be shared. And it must be shared in particular places. So it's um, the joy work of particular churches and synagogues in particular communities, trying and, and mosques in particular communities, trying to gather people together and think out loud together about how we do joy here in this place. Just joining me and thank you. Uh, thank you.